Good afternoon from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephen Clark, editor of Space Flight Now, welcoming you to our live coverage of today's scheduled launch of a GOES weather satellite on board a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. You're looking live at Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, around four miles from our location here at Kennedy Space Center, where the Atlas V is uh, on the verge of being loaded with repellents this afternoon in preparation for liftoff. Today's launch window extends two hours and opens at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 21.38 UTC. There's currently a 70% chance of favorable weather for a launch during today's two-hour window. The uh, primary weather concerns being with ground winds. You can see in this view it is a breezy afternoon here on the Space Coast of Florida. The uh, white caps visible there in the turning basin here at the Kennedy Space Center press site. You can see some of the foliage uh, blowing in the wind. The other uh, concern that weather teams will be watching this afternoon involves uh, cumulus clouds that uh, could pose a threat for launch. They'll be monitoring these constraints along with others throughout the countdown. Liftoff time now two hours and 34 minutes away. At this time, ULA's launch team is being polled for a go or no go to begin cryogenic tanking. The countdown is actually in a built-in hold right now at T minus two hours. The clock should be resuming from T minus two hours and holding in a little less than four minutes. The clock you see on the upper right of your screen is the L minus clock. That's the amount of time actually remaining until the opening of today's launch window. At this time, all weather constraints are currently observed green. However, as I mentioned a moment ago, there is a 30% chance that the weather conditions could uh, toggle red uh, during today's launch window. 70% chance that conditions will be go for launch. And uh, with the two hour window, ULA will have some time to uh, wait for uh, conditions to improve if the weather is no go for the opening of the window at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. United Launch Alliance uh, now confirms that the launch team stationed in the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center a few miles to the south of the launch complex just gave a go to begin cryogenic tanking. Liquid oxygen and uh, liquid hydrogen will be loaded into the Atlas V. Liquid oxygen will go into the first stage and uh, hydrogen and oxygen will go into the Centaur upper stage. The first stage of the Atlas V is already loaded with its supply of RP-1, which is a rocket-grade kerosene fuel. That kerosene fuel is stored at room temperature and was loaded into the rocket yesterday.
And the countdown clock is now at T minus two hours and counting. The clock has resumed. The clock you see on the upper right of your view in this uh, image is the L minus clock. That's the time actually remaining until launch. But the uh, official countdown clock is now at T minus one hour, 59 minutes and 36 seconds and counting. That includes a built-in hold time of 30 minutes. The clock will be stopping at T minus four minutes for a half hour hold. During that hold, the ULA team will again be pulled for a final go or no go for launch.
about it. Now around two hours and 17 minutes to go in today's countdown. United Launch Alliance uh, just confirmed that uh, uh, loading of liquid oxygen has begun. This process to load super cold oxidizer into the second stage. This process to load uh, oxidizer into the second stage now getting underway out at Space Launch Complex 41. The liquid oxygen will be consumed in a uh, mixture with liquid hydrogen by the Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. Around 4,150 gallons of liquid oxygen, or LOX, will be loaded into Stage 2 on the Atlas V rocket. Later in the countdown, we'll see the start of uh, liquid oxygen loading into the Atlas first stage, as well as liquid hydrogen into the Centaur upper stage.
Okay, Steven, are we ready? I am with Pam Sullivan, the Gozar Program Director from NOAA. Pam, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's an exciting day to see GOES-T launch. Can you talk about the importance of the GOES satellites to the nation? What, uh, what makes this mission so important? Yeah, the GOES-R satellites are really the, uh, only con the only satellites that have a continuous view of weather and hazardous environmental conditions across uh, the Western Hemisphere. So if you want to know what's happening right now with dangerous conditions, the GOES-R satellites are really the only game in town. Uh, this satellite is the third of four in this GOES-R series. Um, I guess, first of all, can you talk about what's different about the GOES-R series in general from the previous generation? And then uh, maybe talk a little bit about what's different about this satellite from the previous two GOES-R satellites. Yeah, the GOES-R uh, series were, was a really incredible upgrade um, from the previous generation. We were actually, uh, the main camera takes um, 60 times more imagery than the previous generation, and that is both um, improved temporal resolution, improved spatial resolution, and uh, improved spectral resolution. Um, and uh, we also have a brand new, uh, first ever of its kind, uh, geostationary lightning mapper uh, that is uh, very key to watching storms that, are, that have lightning and are likely to produce uh, dangerous winds or tornadoes. And so that's what kind of goes R is different from uh, from the previous generation goes N. Um, for goes T, it's very similar to the goes R and S satellites, um, but we have made some changes uh, that are focusing on uh, lessons learned that we have from goes R and S on orbit. Uh, probably the most significant thing is we've redesigned the advanced baseline imager uh, thermal system to avoid the problem that we saw on goes S, where the detectors sometimes um, overheat. And so we've got a brand new radiator and, and loopy pipe uh, system that is that is there. Um, the other uh, significant change I would say for GOES-T is we've got a new magnetometer uh, that should give uh, more accurate readings of space weather conditions and help us with forecasts for um, uh, dangerous conditions for space tourists, for example, um, or for uh, monitoring things like uh, changes in the, uh, um, the, in the space environment that affects drag and, and can lead to some satellites re-entering as we saw a couple weeks ago. And that advanced baseline imager is the main instrument that a lot of the public sees the product of with the, the spectacular imagery of hurricanes, uh, you know, TV weather forecasts, uh, National Hurricane Center forecasts. So that, that, that's the main thing that, you know, people are familiar with the public is seeing the product from that almost every day. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's really, uh, you know, I, I um, it, that is the main camera, but I really think of the Gozar satellites as sort of the Swiss Army knife of satellites. Um, really, they, um, with the ABI, with the GLM, with the space weather instruments, um, we really see any kind of dangerous phenomena that's happening uh, across the Western Hemisphere. So, uh, if this launch happens this afternoon, weather permitting, hopefully, um, the spacecraft is going to be deployed from the Atlas V around three and a half hours after launch. Can you talk about what happens with the spacecraft after it comes off the rocket and goes through its checkout commissioning just what it takes to get into service and when it's going to go into service. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the spacecraft will separate from the launch vehicle actually over Australia on the other side of the, uh, the planet. And uh, first thing, of course, is we deploy the solar array. We get power positive. Um, and then we start to check out the propulsion system because um, the spacecraft uh, needs to use its own propulsion system to go from the geostationary transfer orbit where the rocket leaves us um, all the way up to geostationary orbit. That takes actually about three weeks um, for the satellite to make that climb um, all the way up. Um, once we're on orbit, uh, we point at the Earth, um, we do deployments, um, so all the things that were folded up in the rocket uh, in order to fit in the fairing, we deploy. Um, that includes our magnetometer, that includes the solar array, um, uh, and then uh, we point the instruments um, at Earth, ABI and GLM, we open their doors. Um, about in uh, May, we'll be taking what we call first light, uh, the first pictures uh, from ABI and GLM. Um, we've got a couple more months to do checkout and calibration and tuning, um, but then about July, we expect to be flowing data uh, to the users. Um, and then um, that uh, the users will be able to get the data even while we're continuing to do some checkouts. So um, we'll hand the spacecraft operation over to uh, the NOAA Operations uh, Center um, in October, and then uh, GOES T will go into service as GOES West, uh, probably January. Can you talk about the, the way the constellation works? With the, uh, how many satellites are operational? How many you have in standby? Just uh, you know, how many satellites and assets do you have up there in geostationary orbit? 
Yeah, so um, we operate the GO satellites in a pair of two. We've got one uh, that's at the equator, kind of over the east coast, one at the equator, a little bit off the west coast. Between those two operational satellites, uh, we can really see the entire western hemisphere, all the way over to Africa on the eastern side and all the way over to New Zealand on the west side. Um, and so uh, those two satellites um, together give us a view of um, you know, the weather systems that sort of come in from the west, like most of our weathers do, and then the one in the east gives us uh, a view of things like hurricanes that, that come in from the east. Um, so that's our normal operating uh, condition, is to have those two satellites operating. We also uh, always plan to have an on-orbit spare, um, because if anything happens with either of the two operational satellites, we want to have one to step in immediately, you know, and not have to wait for a launch or something. So, um, so that'll be our plan. Once we get uh, Ghost-T up there, we'll have um, three, uh, both the, op the two operational and then the spare will all be of the Gozar class. And you have one more Gozar class satellite, GOES-U, launching in a couple of years on a SpaceX rocket. Uh, with the, these four Gozar uh, series satellites up there operating as primary and spare satellites, how long uh, until NOAA needs to worry about replacing them? Right. Um, the the uh, GOES-R satellites are going to operate into the mid-2030s. That's our prediction of, you know, fuel life and reliability. Um, they'll go into the uh, the mid-2030s. Um, and uh, But we've, we're already planning the thing that comes after that, um, which is called GEOXO. Um, and we've actually just started formulation officially for that program. Um, and we're targeting a launch in 2032 um, because um, that's when we think we'll be out of the on-orbit spare. So even though Ghost T and Ghost U will probably be operating into the late 2030s. Um, we think R and S um, will we'll have reached the end of life and we'll need the re a replacement capability by 2032. So we're aiming for a GOXO launch in about 10 years. Thank you so much, Pam Sullivan from NOAA's Goes R program, joining us. Uh, a little over two hours, or a little less than two hours left to go until launch now, I believe. Uh, so fingers crossed for a successful on time launch this afternoon and uh, good luck with the mission. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
Now less than two hours remaining until the opening of today's launch window at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 21.38 UTC. That's about an hour, 58 minutes, and 30 seconds away. You're now looking at a live view of the Atlas V rocket on Space Launch Complex 41. This view comes from a camera on the roof of ULA's vertical integration facility. That's the uh, approximately 30-story structure around a third of a mile south of the launch pad where the Atlas V uh, components were stacked and assembled on their mobile launch platform. Yesterday, the Atlas V rolled out to the rocket from the VIF moved into place into the position you see now at Space Launch Complex 41. You're starting to see some gaseous oxygen vapors uh, venting away from the rocket as the Centaur upper stage is now being loaded with liquid oxygen chilled uh, around minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That uh, cryogenic oxidizer will be consumed by the RL-10 engine during three main engine burns on today's mission. Later in the countdown, the ULA will start loading liquid hydrogen fuel into that Centaur stage. ULA also has uh, confirmed in the last few minutes that liquid oxygen has started loading into the Atlas first stage. You can see that bronze uh, Atlas first stage uh, comprising about the lower 60% or so of the rocket in this view. Some frost beginning to build up there on the uh, bronze skin of that first stage structure. That frost uh, being uh, generated and produced by the super cold oxidizer now being pumped inside that liquid oxygen tank of the first stage. Continues to be a breezy afternoon here at Cape Canaveral. Again, the weather forecast calls for a 70% chance of good weather for launch during today's two hour window. And the primary weather concerns are with ground winds and with cumulus cloud cover overhead. One hour, 56 minutes to go.
the Atlas 5 countdown is now passing T minus 1 hour, 15 minutes, 47 seconds. That does include a 30 minute hold that's uh, coming up at T minus 4 minutes. So the clock you see in the upper right is the actual time until the opening of the launch window at 1 hour, 45 minutes, and 36 seconds from now. Liftoff time remains scheduled for 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 21.38 UTC, the opening of a two-hour window this afternoon here at Cape Canaveral. Earlier this afternoon, we spoke with Alina Moses, a launch weather officer from the 45th Weather Squadron, part of uh, Space Launch Delta from the United States Space Force, which runs the Eastern Range here at Cape Canaveral. The uh, 45th Weather Squadron provides weather forecasts for all rocket launches and uh, space operations based out of the Florida spaceport. And Alina Moses talked a little bit about uh, what her squadron does and how their squadron uses the GOES weather satellites, like the one about to launch this afternoon, as well as gave uh, a, a brief uh, forecast for the conditions expected during this afternoon's launch window. We're here with Arlena Moses, the launch weather officer from the 45th Weather Squadron. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what your office and uh, squadron does here at Cape Canaveral? Yes, yes I can. The uh, 45th Weather Squadron, uh, which is located on Cape Canaveral Space Force Station uh, here in uh, Central Florida, right just south of the Kennedy Space, uh, Space Center, we're pretty much co-located. Uh, we are responsible uh, for assuring safe access to space. And our part of that is the weather part, where I'm sure, as we all know, weather plays a very big role in making sure that our rockets uh, get to space uh, safely, uh, that they launch safely from, from here at both Cape Canaveral and from the Kennedy Space Center. And our primary role in that is uh, what we look at the weather safety rules, or what we call our lightning launch commit criteria, essentially looking at uh, the potential for electrification of the clouds or the rocket uh, causing that electrification as it goes through some of our cloud layers. So today's launch is carrying a new GOES weather satellite into orbit. Uh, can you speak a little about how your squadron and how uh, the weather team here at Cape Canaveral uses GOES imagery in their daily forecasting? Oh, it's it's super important. Uh, because we're here in Florida, we actually use uh, primarily the GOES East satellite, uh, which was launched uh, you know a few years back. Uh, I believe it was the first one in this current series that we're looking at. Um, and that's, you know, every meteorologist will tell you it's a, a big role in what we do. It helps us both monitor uh, what's going on, giving that big view from the sky, um, as well as helping to forecast then what may happen later by seeing how the, the various patterns and uh, weather systems are, are moving. Especially here in Florida, which we have a pretty big ocean uh, to our east, and we even have the Gulf of Mexico to our west, uh, give us a view of what's going on when we don't have those land-based observations. So the, this afternoon, how's the weather looking for launch uh, during the window today? As you can see, uh, it's pretty sunny outside right now. We, uh, we lucked out. We've been trending much better. We started out the day kind of cloudy and gloomy. Uh, but overall, weather is looking pretty good. Our main concerns are going to be these breezy conditions that we're seeing right now, as well as the passing clouds. Just going to keep an eye on them to make sure that they you know, don't get tall enough or uh, dense enough in the wrong place to cause that concern for those, uh, that electrification uh, of the clouds. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. That was Alina Moses, a launch weather officer from the 45th Weather Squadron at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The 45th Weather Squadron provides uh, weather forecast services and weather monitoring services for all users on the range, on the Eastern Range here in Central Florida. The official weather forecast at, the, at this moment uh, continues to call for a 70% chance of favorable weather for liftoff of the Atlas V during today's two hour launch window. Ground winds and cumulus clouds remain the primary concerns. Now, one hour and 41 minutes and 30 seconds until the opening of today's launch window. We're not aware of any technical issues that are being discussed at this time among the Atlas V launch team members. The Atlas V team is uh, stationed at the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, a few miles south of the Atlas V launch pad. This time, propellant loading is continuing with liquid oxygen being uh, flowing, being flowed into the Atlas booster stage. You can see some gaseous oxygen venting away from the launch vehicle in this view. Frost and ice beginning to build up. That is normal. 
as the super cold propellant is loaded into the vehicle. The Centaur upper stage, which is uh, partially contained within that uh, nose cone on top of the Atlas V rocket, is already fully loaded with liquid oxygen. And the liquid hydrogen load uh, is expected to get underway very shortly. That'll be the final propellant tank to be loaded. This Atlas V rocket uh, is powered by a first stage RD-180 main engine made in Russia. It uh, consumes that liquid oxygen in a mixture with kerosene fuel. This RP-1 kerosene, which is a highly refined kerosene, was loaded into the rocket yesterday. And this uh, particular Atlas V will fly with four strap-on solid rocket boosters clustered around the base of that first stage. Those uh, strap-on boosters are made by Northrop Grumman and fabricated in Utah. And those boosters are already loaded with their pre-packed uh, solid propellant. Uh, they come fully fueled from the factory and are integrated with the Atlas V inside the uh, integration building here at Cape Canaveral. Now less than one hour and 40 minutes until launch time for the Atlas V rocket with the uh, GOES-T weather satellite for NOAA.
Now 90 minutes left to go until the opening of today's two-hour launch window. The ULA launch conductor just gave the team a go to begin loading liquid hydrogen into the Centaur upper stage. This is the final propellant tank on the Atlas V rocket to be loaded today. The uh, Centaur upper stage is already fully loaded with 4,150 gallons of liquid oxygen. And the uh, nearly 49,000 gallon tank on a uh, liquid oxygen tank on the first stage is nearly full at this point. Uh, a little bit to go there. And 25,000 gallons of kerosene fuel has already been loaded into the Atlas first stage. That was actually loaded into the rocket yesterday. And we just heard the uh, latest figure for the Atlas first stage liquid oxygen level now 80% full.
Now T minus 54 minutes and 30 seconds, or one hour, 24 minutes and 30 seconds uh, from liftoff time. The countdown clock is heading toward a built-in hold at T minus four minutes and, and holding. That hold will last for 30 minutes. This view of the Atlas V out on Space Launch Complex 41 comes from the NASA Causeway a few miles to the south of the launch pad. You can see uh, the heat waves there uh, over the uh, waterway here at Cape Canaveral. And you can see the white caps from these breezy conditions we're experiencing this afternoon. The uh, Centaur liquid hydrogen tank is now being loaded with fuel. The Atlas first stage is 90% full of liquid oxygen. The Centaur upper stage is 100% or uh, nearly 100% full of liquid oxygen. It's continuing to be topped off throughout the rest of the countdown very slowly. A few moments ago, uh, ULA's launch team began uh, final preps of the Atlas V flight control system. And this involves uh, multiple steps, including a steering check of the propulsion systems on the Atlas V, the engines, to make sure that their thrust vector control or gimbal uh, units are ready to go. Those uh, thrust vector controls will steer the rocket during the climb to space this afternoon. The Centaur liquid hy hydrogen tank is now 10% full. Uh, 12,300 gallons of this super cold fluid uh, chilled to uh, minus, 423, minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit will be loaded into the Atlas V's Centaur upper stage. This view shows the Atlas V from a vantage point on the roof of the vertical integration facility. This is ULA's rocket assembly hangar at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Stands 293 feet tall, located about a third of a mile south of the Space Launch Complex 41 area you see in this view. The Atlas V, uh, they are prominent in the center of the screen with uh, it's sitting on the mobile launch platform. To the left of the mobile launch platform in the dark uh, charcoal colored structure is the crew access tower. That was built up a few years ago to prepare for crew launches on the Atlas V rocket aboard Boeing's Starliner capsule. The Boeing Starliner is designed to ferry astronauts to and from the International Space Station under contract to NASA. Still waiting for the first crew flight on a Starliner spacecraft. Uh, the Starliner flew back in 2019 on an unpiloted test flight to low Earth orbit. However, that flight was uh, cut short by software issues. The spacecraft was unable to dock with the space station. It returned to Earth uh, for a successful landing in New Mexico. However, the uh, problems uh, delayed the program a, a couple of years, uh, and Boeing is still uh, preparing to uh, redo that test flight, an unpiloted test flight, before NASA clears the Starliner to carry astronauts. The four uh, slender structures you see on each side of the Atlas V with the uh, white caps are the lightning protection system. Those towers are connected with a, a series of catenary wires you may be able to uh, just vaguely make out in this view. The uh, towers protect the rocket from lightning strikes while it's on the pad. You can see the Atlantic coastline in the background there. This view looking uh, generally in a northeasterly direction. The Atlas uh, five rocket is located just inland from the Atlantic coast at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Other features of the launch pad visible here include the uh, spherical uh, tank on the right side of the screen. That's the liquid oxygen storage tank used to load oxidizer into the rocket. Now one hour and 20 minutes until the opening of today's launch window at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 21.38 UTC.
We just heard confirmation from uh, ULA's launch team that the Atlas first stage liquid oxygen tank has reached the 97% level and is now in topping mode. So the uh, propellant loading process this afternoon is uh, nearing conclusion. The main activity still to go is the uh, final loading uh, of the final uh, liquid hydrogen into the Centaur upper stage. That loading of that tank just got underway a few minutes ago. The Atlas V rocket you see out on pad 41 stands 196 feet or 59.7 meters tall. And inside that uh, nose cone or payload fairing is the NOAA GOES T weather satellite. GOES T was built by Lockheed Martin in Denver, Colorado. It carries a suite of six instruments to observe uh, weather, both in Earth's atmosphere as, we as well as space weather. It's heading for a position in geostationary orbit more than 22,000 miles or uh, almost 36,000 kilometers over the equator. It'll be going through a nearly a year's worth of uh, orbit raising, uh, checkouts, commissioning, and calibration before officially entering service uh, sometime at the beginning of next year. It'll be taking position over the Pacific Ocean and Western United States with uh, visibility uh, for its weather sensors extending all the way uh, well into the Western Pacific beyond Hawaii at the westernmost extent, as well as across North America and South America up to Alaska. Much of the uh, Western Hemisphere will be covered by this satellite, providing real-time imagery of uh, things like hurricanes and typhoons. It'll be able to uh, detect and uh, identify the locations of uh, wildfires as well as track volcanic ash plumes. The spacecraft also has a lightning mapping instrument that will uh, detect and locate lightning strikes uh, within the satellite's field of view. The Centaur liquid hydrogen tank is now half full, 50% uh, full, just reported from ULA. Continues to be breezy here at Cape Canaveral this afternoon. However, at this time, all weather parameters are observed green. So no, none of the Atlas V's weather uh, constraints are currently uh, being violated by the conditions this afternoon. Skies are clear. So it looks like the uh, ground winds may be, may be the only issue of note that the weather team will be watching uh, throughout the remainder of the countdown. However, at this time, winds are green.
We're here with Arlena Moses, the launch weather officer from the 45th Weather Squadron. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what your office and uh, squadron does here at Cape Canaveral? Yes, yes I can. The uh, 45th Weather Squadron, uh, which is located on Cape Canaveral Space Force Station uh, here.
Now one hour, seven minutes, and 34 seconds until launch. This mission is carrying NOAA's GOES-T weather satellite into orbit. And the GOES weather satellites are one of the uh, space, pro space projects that uh, touch virtually uh, every U.S. citizen, the lives of every U.S. citizen. Meteorologists uh, across uh, North America and South America rely on these GO satellites to uh, track hurricanes and severe weather. This morning, I spoke with Chrissy Hurley, the warning coordination meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Nashville, Tennessee, about how she has used GOES weather uh, imagery in her job in the past and the importance of this satellite for the future of weather observations from space. I'm here with Chrissy Hurley, a meteorologist from the National Weather Service. Uh, Chrissy, thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. Very excited to talk about GOES T. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your role and your job at the National Weather Service and how you use you've used GOES data before? Well, any forecaster in the National Weather Service in the operations area, you know, is so used to having that quick satellite data that comes in every 15, 30, 60 seconds. And you know that information can be life-saving. We use this data for fire weather detection as far as you know, spot fires. We use it for fog, uh, dust, for aviation purposes. And we use it to track the intensity of thunderstorms, especially with the geostationary lightning mapper, GLM, that tracks lightning data. Uh, this new series of satellites, uh, GOES R, GOES S, this is GOES T. I think it has uh, a lot of upgrades over some earlier generation of GOES satellites. Can you talk about those and how those upgrades are improving forecasting? You know, I've been in the Weather Service about 20 years. And when I first got into the National Weather Service, we were getting GOES satellite data, the previous series. You know, the images were coming in every 15, 30 minutes. So you think your internet is slow now and you're hitting refresh. You can imagine as a forecaster wanting those images. You know, now we're getting images as quick as 15, 30, 60 seconds. And so it's been incredible and, ch you know, drastically changed the way we, you know, can provide forecasts, uh, watches and warnings ahead before hazardous weather impacts an area. Um, this particular satellite is going to the GOES West position. Um, can you talk about the geographic area it'll be covering and what types of weather over there will uh, this satellite be monitoring most often? You know, <clears throat> with GOES T going over across the western half of the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and the Pacific Ocean, it's really filling a data void across the Pacific Ocean. We don't have observing equipment over the ocean. We're not launching weather balloons in the middle on top of the water. And so it really fills that data gap that helps forecasters here in the mainland because weather moves west to east. And so whatever's going on across the Pacific Ocean, we have a better idea of what's happening because of that data. I've heard some people talk also about uh, using the GOES satellites to monitor things like wildfires and uh, volcanic eruptions, which are more common in the Pacific Basin and the West Coast area. Um, can you talk about some of the things, you know, beyond uh, conventional weather that we may think of storms and hurricanes that GOES satellites can help out with? You know, the, this GOES series of satellites, it is incredible. Uh, the Kincaid, California fire. GOES satellite infrared imagery was able to pick up the fire 52 seconds after ignition. And so we can use tools like that, especially across the Western United States, where, you know, information like that is most definitely life-saving. And uh, the satellites also carry a space weather instrument suite uh, looking at the sun and uh, some of the uh, sun's impacts on Earth. Uh, what, uh, what does that offer to forecasters and uh, what, what is the benefit of GOES satellites to space weather forecasting? Well, you know, I, one of the great things is, you know, it, it monitors, you know, space weather, um, you know, anything that could impact the atmosphere. In fact, uh, just on January 1st, it, the GLM, the Geostationary Lightning Mapper, was able to uh, identify a meteorite that came into the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. And so it's, you know, brought in uh, 
positives that we didn't even know that it was going to when we launched these GO satellites. I guess that's the benefit of always having the, the eye, on, eye in the sky turned on looking at planet Earth. Right, you know, I, when we got those, uh, you know, reports of, you know, those potential meteorites, people didn't know what it was, uh, we looked to GO satellite and was able to solve the question. Okay, Chrissy, thank you for joining us. Again, that was Chrissy Hurley, a meteorologist at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Nashville, talking about how she has used the GOES imagery in her job as a warning coronation meteorologist, tracking severe weather. We thank her for joining us uh, in, our live, in, our, in our live coverage and uh, discussing the importance of the GOES-T weather satellite. Just a, a quick status update on the countdown. The Atlas V rocket is uh, nearly fully loaded with, with uh, propellants. If you've been watching our coverage throughout the last hour or so, you will have noticed that the Atlas first stage, which comprises about the bottom uh, 50 to 60 percent of the rocket, has turned from a uh, bronze color to a white color as ice and frost has built up on the skin of the first stage. That frost uh, produced as uh, liquid oxygen was loaded into the rocket. That liquid oxygen is chilled to minus 298 degrees Fahrenheit. The first stage of the Atlas V will burn for about 4 minutes and 21 seconds on today's mission. It's uh, powered by an RD-180 engine produced by MPO Energomash in Russia. That RD-180 engine will produce 860,000 pounds of thrust. It's a dual, no dual nozzle engine burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. Four strap-on solid rocket boosters from Northrop Grumman are clustered around the base of that first stage. Those will provide the bulk of the thrust at liftoff. The total liftoff thrust of this Atlas V rocket will be 2.3 million pounds. Those strap-on boosters will burn for around 90 seconds, a little over 90 seconds, and will be jettisoned at T plus two minutes. Now just past the L minus one hour mark, so less than an hour to go until the opening of today's launch window. In this view, you can uh, now see a helicopter passing uh, just offshore. This looks like one of the uh, numerous helicopters that are used to sweep the area. A security helicopter making sure that uh, the coast is clear in a literal sense to make sure there's no one out there inside the danger area. And ULA has just confirmed that the flat termination system test is complete. Again, this is the onboard mechanism that would terminate the, the rocket, terminate the flight, destroy the rocket if it veered off course during its climb to space. Now less than 59 minutes to go. All weather conditions, all weather parameters rather, are continuing to be uh, green at this time. No weather violations at this point in the countdown and no significant technical issues are being discussed by the ULA launch team here at Cape Canaveral, Florida.
Now 51 minutes and 10 seconds to go until the opening of today's launch window for the Atlas V rocket with the GOES-T weather satellite heading to space for NOAA. This mission will mark the 674th flight of an Atlas launch vehicle since the uh, program's inception back in, 19 back in the 1950s as an uh, ICBM or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Again, it's the 674th flight of an Atlas launch vehicle since the uh, program's inception. It'll be the 375th Atlas launch from Cape Canaveral. And it's also the 263rd mission of a Centaur upper stage. The Centaur is powered by a single Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine. And it'll be the 100, uh, 509th flight of a production RL-10 engine. The first stage of the Atlas V rocket is powered by an RD-180 engine uh, produced by Energomash in Russia. It'll be the 98th flight of an RD-180 engine, including previous flights on Atlas V rockets as well as the uh, previous Atlas III rocket family. And this will be the 103rd launch overall from Space Launch Complex 41. This uh, launch pad was previously uh, used by the Air Force's Titan rocket program before its conversion uh, to support the Atlas V program with the first Atlas V flight happening in 2002. Since that uh, first Atlas V flight, there have been uh, 90 missions since that first one, so 91 in total. This will be the 92nd Atlas V flight overall. And it'll be the 149th mission conducted under the auspices of United Launch Alliance. ULA is a 50-50 joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed Martin and was created in 2006. This rocket is flying in the 541 vehicle configuration. That 5 and 541 uh, denotes the rocket's use of a 5.4 meter diameter payload fairing made by RUAG Space at a fairing production facility in Decatur, Alabama, co-located with ULA's rocket factory. The four uh, symbolizes the four strap-on solid rocket boosters made by Northrop Grumman. And the one uh, simply means there's one RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. Other Atlas V variants can come in configurations with uh, two RL-10 engines. This will be the second launch by ULA this year, the second flight of an Atlas V this year, following a previous mission from this uh, very same launch pad back in January. And it'll be the ninth orbital launch based out of Cape Canaveral or Kennedy Space Center to start the year. Of the previous eight missions, uh, six have been performed by SpaceX, one by ULA, and one by the small satellite launch company Astra. So it'll be the ninth orbital launch attempt out of Cape Canaveral. That Astra flight that did not succeed in reaching orbit. You're now looking live at Space Launch Complex 41, where the Atlas V rocket is fully fueled, weighs nearly 1.2 million pounds, fully loaded with kerosene, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and solid rocket propellant. The four strap-on boosters and RD-180 first stage engine will combine to produce 2.3 million pounds of thrust. So that, if you do the math, that's about a thrust to weight ratio of, of roughly two to one, which means the Atlas V will uh, take off in a, a bit of a hurry uh, from that thrust from those strap-on boosters and main engine. Now 46 minutes and 30 seconds. The official countdown clock is uh, reading T minus 16 minutes and 30 seconds. The countdown clock is actually heading to a built-in hold at T minus four minutes. That hold will last for a half hour. 
And during that 30-minute hold, ULA's launch team will be polled for a go or no-go to proceed into the terminal countdown and to launch this mission for NOAA. This mission carrying the GOES-T weather satellite to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. ULA's launch team now confirms the fuel fill sequence is underway for the RD-180 main engine. This is one of the uh, preparatory steps to uh, configure and ready the RD-180 for ignition. Launch remains scheduled for 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 21.38 UTC, the opening of a two-hour launch window this afternoon.
Now 41 minutes to go until the opening of today's launch window. The countdown clock is officially uh, just past the T-minus 11 minute mark, heading to a built-in hold at T-minus 4 minutes. Once again, at this time, the Atlas V rocket with its uh, first stage as well as the Centaur upper stage, both fully loaded with propellants. A fully fueled Atlas V rocket now standing at Space Launch Complex 41.
We're now looking at a view inside the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center where the ULA team is gathered. The countdown just hit the T minus four minute hold point. This hold is expected to last uh, 30 minutes. And during this hold, the team will be pulled uh, toward the end of the hold for a go or no go to proceed into the terminal countdown and launch of the Atlas V. Everything looking good right now for an on-time liftoff at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 21.38 UTC. All weather parameters currently uh, green at this time. No technical issues that we're aware of in the countdown. You're now seeing a spectacular aerial shot of the Atlas V at its seaside launch complex. Gorgeous afternoon for a launch here on the space coast of Florida. Winds are breezy. Uh, that's the main weather concern at this time. But uh, right now those winds are under the limit. Not exceeding the Atlas V's uh, launch commit criteria at this time. So we're hoping that remains the case over the next half hour or so as ULA prepares to launch its second mission of the year and the 92nd flight of an Atlas V rocket overall since its debut back in August of 2002. The Atlas V has carried uh, numerous satellites to orbit for the United States Air Force and Space Force the National Reconnaissance Office, NASA, this mission carrying the GOES-T satellite to orbit, a weather observatory for NOAA. NASA also plays a role in this mission. NASA in charge is in charge of procuring the spacecraft and procuring the launch service for this mission on behalf of NOAA. So uh, you'll hear uh, later in the countdown, you may hear the voice of Tim Dunn, who is the NASA launch manager. In this view, you're seeing at the uh, Kennedy Space Center press site around four miles away. This is our location. Looking across the uh, turn basin and the foliage out toward the launch pad where the Atlas V rocket is waiting to go to space this afternoon.
All is quiet right now on the uh, ULA launch countdown net. No issues being worked at this time. A clean vehicle. Weather parameters continue to remain green. Everything continues to look good for an on-time launch. can see some uh, low-level clouds now passing over the launch pad. Uh, these particular clouds are, are not expected to be a concern for launch. Now 26 minutes to go. This mission uh, will be carrying the GOES-T weather satellite into orbit. The Atlas V will be heading due east from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station out over the Atlantic Ocean. This easterly trajectory is necessary to place the GOES-T weather satellite into a transfer orbit that will uh, culminate with the spacecraft using its on onboard propulsion system to reach a circular geostationary orbit 22,000 miles over the equator. At that altitude, the spacecraft will be orbiting Earth in lockstep with the uh, planet's rotation, giving it a fixed uh, geographic coverage area. The coverage area for this spacecraft will be over the Western Americas and the Pacific Ocean. Now less than 23 minutes to go. The Atlas V launch team is now loading the trajectory file into the Atlas V's flight computer. 
This trajectory file takes into account the uh, real-time observed upper-level winds over the launch site today, giving the Atlas V uh, an optimum uh, steering profile to uh, climb through those winds and climb through the atmosphere on the way to space with the GOES-T weather satellite. And ULA just now confirmed that that trajectory file has been successfully loaded into the flight computer. They got its computer on board the Atlas V. That uh, computer is known as the Inertial Navigation and Control Assembly, or INCA. A series of uh, weather balloons uh, were launched throughout the countdown this afternoon to measure upper level winds and uh, this trajectory file takes into account that upper level wind data. Again, it gives the Atlas V guidance computer the uh, proper commands to uh, steer the rocket through those wind profiles today. 21 minutes and 20 seconds left in the uh, countdown to liftoff at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 21.38 UTC for those of you in other time zones. Everything continues to look good for launch on time.
the latest report from ULA is that the weather conditions continue to look favorable. The outlook now calls for a 90% chance of go conditions for liftoff at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it looks like it's all coming together right now for a launch this afternoon. This will be the ninth launch from the Eastern Range this year. And the second of uh, the second launch of the year by United Launch Alliance. this view you can see the uh, the wind speeds here are quite brisk this afternoon however they're within limits for liftoff of the Atlas V you can see those uh, gaseous oxygen vapors streaming away from the Atlas V that's the uh, vapors uh, that have burned off from the liquid oxygen inside the rocket also some uh, scattered low-level clouds streaming overhead at this time those clouds and those winds are currently within limits, not a constraint for launch. Everything looking good at this time. The countdown clock remains in a hold at T minus four minutes. This is a built in or pre planned hold. So, in the next five or six minutes or so, we expect to hear the Atlas launch team inside the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center go through their pre flight poll for a go or no go to pick up the countdown and proceed into the launch. Everything at this point looks like the launch will happen at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. No technical issues being worked. So we'll be standing by for that poll from ULA's launch conductor in a few minutes. The poll by the NASA launch manager, Tim Dunn, has been completed with a go from NASA's launch team for liftoff today. With this uh, final poll of NASA's management complete, all that's left is the poll of the Atlas V launch team from United Launch Alliance. That'll be performed by the launch conductor in just a few minutes.
Now approaching uh, seven and a half minutes until launch. The final status check from ULA's launch conductor is moments away. Everything continues to look good for an on-time liftoff at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The countdown clock is in a built-in hold right now at T-minus four minutes. That uh, clock will resume at 4.34 p.m. Eastern Time, assuming the final poll uh, does result in a go for launch. L minus seven. L minus seven minutes. Status check proceed. Status terminal check count. Atlas atlas terminal count. Atlas, atlas system. Go. Propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatic. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Go. LO2. Water. Go. Go. Water. Centaur system. Go. Propulsion. Centaur system. Go. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. As gas. Go. Electrical systems. Go. Airborne. Ground. Go. Go. Ground. Facility. Go. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. TCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with account. ALC verify T0 is set for 2138 Zulu. Verified. L minus five minutes and 30 seconds. NSC, verify spacecraft is configured for launch. Spacecraft is configured for launch. All checks complete. Uh, terminal clear. Three, two, one, mark. Three fifty five. Ground pyros enabled. And you have heard the poll from the ULA's launch conductor gave a unanimous go for launch. And the countdown clock has resumed T minus four minutes. Everything looking good for an on time launch this afternoon.
159. Now less than two minutes to go. Launch sequencer start. The automatic launch sequencer Securing has Centaur been initiated. Securing Centaur this time the Atlas first stage and Centaur upper stage are switching to internal power. And the first stage propellant tanks uh, have been pressurized for flight. 137. FCS armed. FCS armed. 120. FCS armed. FCS count started. 115. Reduce ECS for launch. Roger. 110. Bend valves locked. One minute. One Rock, minute. report range status. Range green. Range green. Now less than 60 seconds to go. The range is green. Everything looking good for launch of the Atlas V with GOES T, heading to geostationary orbit to provide weather imagery and weather data across the Pacific Ocean seconds. and the Western United Stay States. Blood. Step three. We'll listen in to ULA's launch team as they call out the final seconds of the countdown. T minus 30 seconds. Verify ECS reduced for launch. Verify. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go goes T. Parameters look good. View has gone to closed loop control. The RD-180 is now throttling down as expected. Engine response looks good. We are now 33 seconds Atlas into flight. Atlas 5 is away Atlas from Cape Canaveral. Atlas 5 lifting off altitude. with the GOES T weather Nine satellite. Downrange distance. The rumble now reaching our location at the Kennedy Space yeah, Center press site. Mach 1. Vehicle is Rocket now, now supersonic. Max maximum dynamic pressure. Now 55 seconds into flight, Atlas is 7 miles in altitude, 4 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,900 miles per hour. RD-180 is now throttling back up. Now at 75 seconds into flight, Atlas is 13 miles in altitude, 10 miles downrange distance, traveling at 2,700 miles per hour. Now at 90 seconds into flight, ULA's Atlas V rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of more than 2,600 pounds per second. Spectacular onboard camera views coming down from the Atlas V. SRBs have burned out as expected, and we see a good SRB jettison. And there's jettison, beautiful views Vehicle as the four strap-on motors are jettisoned from the Atlas V. Vehicle, vehicle performance looks good at this time. Now 135 seconds into flight. The RD-180 has throttled down slightly. Vehicle performance continues to look good at this time. Tank pressures are stable and Atlas booster battery voltages remain in their expected ranges. Now the upper stage is preparing for its use. Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing to flight levels.
Now, T plus three minutes with those four strap-on boosters away. The Atlas V now being powered by the RD-180 main engine. Coming up on payload fairing Just Jettison. over one minute until Biko. We're now seeing uh, the RD-180 throttle limiting to maintain a 2.5G acceleration limit. Standing by for payload fairing Jettison. And we've seen a successful payload fairing jettison. RD-180 is throttled back up now. And we saw that 5.4-meter uh, diameter the vehicle has reached payload fairing jettison cleanly. 4.6G acceleration limit, and we'll maintain this level through BECO. We've seen that the Centaur has begun its boost phase chill down sequence. And Biko, booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage separation and a successful stage separation event. We've seen pre start on the RL10. And mass one, we have ignition for the first burn. This first burn of ULA's Centaur upper stage will place the GOES-T spacecraft into a parking orbit around the Earth. This burn will last just over seven minutes. Seeing the expected activity on the reaction control system as it begins its periodic firings to maintain thermal control conditioning. Upper stage systems look good at this time. Hydrogen line temperatures are approaching the bottle temperature as expected. The engine propellant utilization system has gone to closed loop control, and the engine response remains nominal. I just received word from the trajectory and performance group that booster performance was as expected for the booster phase of flight.
Now less than four minutes left in this first burn by the Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. This burn will place the Ghost-T satellite into a parking orbit. As we've heard from ULA's telemetry commentator, so far so good with this 90-second flight of an Atlas V rocket. Good performance from those uh, four strap-on boosters and the first stage and its RD-180 main engine. And uh, this first RL-10 Centaur burn now more than halfway complete. The rocket heading due east out over the Atlantic Ocean. As you heard from ULA's telemetry commentator, about 90 seconds left in this RL-10 engine burn to place the GOES T weather satellite into a low altitude parking orbit. In the upper right of your screen, you can see some live telemetry data. That perigee altitude uh, is currently in the negative. That will go positive shortly before cutoff of the RL-10 engine to uh, confirm that the Centaur is orbital. Thirty seconds remaining in this first burn of the upper stage. We have IIP we have vanish. IIP vanish. The centaur, the centaur is now orbital. The PU system has gone open loop. Standing by for the end of the burn, and we have Miko. Main engine has cut off. At this time, the GOES-T spacecraft and ULA's Centaur upper stage are in an unpowered coast phase that will last approximately 11 minutes. The coast allows the vehicle to move to the optimal orbital position in the orbit prior to beginning the second main engine burn. The reaction control system is operating at the 100% settling mode at this time.
in this animation, you can see the Centaur stage now in an unpowered coast. The RL-10 engine shut down as expected. On the upper right, you can see the uh, orbital parameters for this parking orbit. A perigee of around 171 kilometers, an apogee of around uh, 493 kilometers, and an inclination of 21.1 degrees to the equator. The Atlas V is coasting out over the Atlantic Ocean. The Centaur upper stage will reignite its RL-10 engine uh, about the time it gets to the equator to begin maneuvers to climb into a higher orbit and maneuver into an orbit closer to the equator with a lower inclination. Three burns are planned today. The first burn is already complete. That second burn due All to begin. All vehicle systems continue to operate as expected during this coast phase. We're about 14 and a half minutes into flight with eight minutes remaining in this first coast. The expected ignition time for the second Centaur burn is T plus 23 minutes and 39 seconds. And that burn will last nearly five minutes. We're now just over 16 and a half minutes into the Atlas flight. The Centaur reaction control system is beginning a slow ramp down to a 60% settling level for the remainder of this coast. We're now just over 18 minutes into the Atlas flight. Uh, the vehicle is coasting at an altitude of about 110 miles above the Atlantic Ocean. We're approaching the western coast of Australia. Correction, western coast of Africa.
In approximately three minutes, the Centaur engine will ignite for a second time to begin the second burn of today's mission. Approximately 20 seconds prior to ignition, the RL-10 engine will begin the fuel and oxidizer pre-start sequence. This burn will last approximately six minutes. Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. The RL-10 thrust chamber pressure is right in as expected band for joint engine burn, and your performance looks good at this time. This uh, second burn by the Centaur Upper Stages RL-10 engine is underway. This burn is expected to last around four and a half minutes to 
raise the altitude of the GOES-T satellite's orbit. In this animation, you can see the apogee altitude that represents the high point of this uh, vehicle's orbit, uh, now climbing steadily past 4,000 kilometers Thanks to the impulse from the RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage, you can see the inclination number uh, now being reduced from uh, 28.1 degrees, now approaching 27 degrees, all part of uh, maneuvers to guide GOES-T toward its eventual perch in geostationary orbit. The Atlas V uh, and its Centaur upper stage will drop off the satellite in uh, a highly elliptical or elongated uh, transfer orbit after the three burns by the Centaur upper stage. At that point, the GOES-T spacecraft will be deployed. It will separate from the rocket, deploy its solar panel, and use its own engine to do the rest of the lifting to circularize its orbit at 22,000 miles, or nearly 36,000 kilometers, over the equator. At that point, it will be in what's called a geostationary orbit. It will be orbiting Earth at the same rate of the planet's rotation. That pretty much means the satellite will be in lockstep with the planet as it rotates, maintaining a fixed uh, coverage zone. It will remain over the same location on the planet uh, 24 hours a day. Now, about three minutes into this burn, Looks good at this time. All body rates are near zero. PU has gone to open loop control. And we have Miko 2, second stage main engine cutoff. RCS is now operating at 100% settling level. And the vehicle is now turning to its PC PTC roll attitude. ULA has confirmed a successful shutdown of the RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage, completing the second of three burns on today's mission. Centaur is now entering an extended duration coast phase. Uh, this coast phase will last approximately 180 minutes, where we'll have a third burn prior to spacecraft separation. The rocket is now coasting over Africa. You can see in those orbital parameters on the upper right, the Centaur upper stage and GOES-T are now in a highly elliptical orbit with an apogee stretching more than 32,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. 
The rocket will now be coasting for about three hours before restart of the Centaur engine one more time. That third Centaur engine burn will last approximately 100 seconds, a minute 40 seconds, to set the stage for separation of the Ghost T spacecraft at T plus three hours and 33 minutes. So that spacecraft deployment event is expected at 8.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1.11 UTC.
Now T plus 52 minutes and 50 seconds into today's Atlas V mission with the GOES-T weather spacecraft for NOAA. You're now looking at a view of Space Launch Complex 41, an empty launch pad. At the bottom of the view there, you can see some of the emergency fire rescue teams as well as ULA crews back at the launch pad for their uh, customary post-launch uh, inspection and walk down. This is a uh, standard uh, operation after every launch to send out uh, safety crews to uh, check for any damage, check for anything that may be unsafe before uh, clearing the pad for re-entry by uh, the rest of the uh, launch team. So you can see some of those team members out there walking around the pad deck at this time, as well as uh, some uh, fire trucks with their emergency lights on. Liftoff of the Atlas V occurred uh, 53 minutes, 50 seconds ago at 4.38 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 21.38 UTC. The initial phases of the flight uh, have been successful so far with the climb out of the Atlas V from Pad 41 with its uh, four strap-on solid rocket boosters, its RD-180 main engine, all performing uh, as expected according to ULA. Those strap-on boosters jettisoned at two minutes into the mission. The Atlas V uh, shed its nose cone at uh, T plus three minutes and 30 seconds. And then the main stage, powered by its Russian RD-180 engine, shut down and separated just shy of the four and a half minute mark in the mission. That uh, cleared the way for ignition of the RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. That RL-10 engine has completed two of its three burns now. One more burn still to go. The Atlas V, uh, the Atlas V Centaur upper stage now coasting over the Indian Ocean in this view, climbing to higher altitude uh, for that restart of the RL-10 engine. Expected the expected ignition time for that is 8:06 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1:06 UTC. That burn will last a little over a minute and a half, and then separation of the Ghost T spacecraft is scheduled for T plus three hours and 33 minutes. That's 8.11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. With this launch uh, now off the pad, attention here at Cape Canaveral, we're t we'll turn to uh, Launch Complex 39A, a few miles to the north of Pad 41, where SpaceX is preparing to launch a Falcon 9 rocket as soon as Thursday with another batch of Starlink internet satellites. That mission is scheduled for liftoff uh, shortly after 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time or 14.30 UTC, carrying the next group of satellites for SpaceX's Starlink internet network. That'll be followed uh, on March 4th, Friday, with the launch of a Russian Soyuz rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan carrying 36 internet satellites for OneWeb. OneWeb is another company building out a mega constellation of broadband satellites. That mission is uh, right now expected to go forward despite the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fallout from that event. Preparations are proceeding at Baikonur uh, as of today with, uh, with preparations uh, underway for rollout of the Soyuz rocket out to its launch pad tomorrow in preparation for launch on Friday. That liftoff time Friday is scheduled for 5.41 p.m. Eastern Time or 10.41 uh, p.m. UTC. And next week, another SpaceX Falcon 9 launch is scheduled from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, another Starlink mission scheduled to take off next week, March the 8th, a week from today. And then the next uh, launch beyond that that we have a confirmed target date for is another Soyuz launch from Baikonur Cosmodrome on March the 18th, carrying uh, three Russian cosmonauts on the Soyuz MS-21 spacecraft. Those cosmonauts will be heading to the International Space Station to start a six-month expedition in orbit as part of the station's long-term crew. So those are the next uh, launches on our uh, calendar here. We'll be covering each and every one of those. We'll have live coverage on our YouTube channel for the launches occurring here at Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center. 
And we'll, of course, have coverage of those other missions on our website at spaceflightnow.com. We welcome you also to become a member of uh, Spaceflight Now. You can go to uh, spaceflightnow.com and click the Members tab at the top of the home page. We appreciate um, any support you can offer. It really helps us to uh, make coverage like this possible. We're going to conclude our live, live commentary at this time, but we'll uh, be continuing to monitor the rest of the Atlas V and Ghost T uh, mission with this uh, third upper stage burn still to come, as well as the spacecraft separation event. We'll be uh, updating that on our homepage. We'll be updating that on social media. And look out for a, a comprehensive uh, wrap-up story later tonight to recap this mission. A successful start so far, but it's still a couple of critical events to go. So uh, stay with us uh, on our website and social media for those events. Until then, thank you for joining us. I'm Stephen Clark reporting live from Kennedy Space Center, and we'll see you for the next launch. <laughs>